Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the final three months of the year 2013. And this particular lesson is lesson number six in a series about the sanctuary, the ancient sanctuary in the temple. It's entitled, The Day of Atonement. You may have heard of the Day of Atonement, have some ideas about it. It's a uh, quite a process. We need to look at it carefully. This is lesson number six for November 9 of 2013. I hope you've got your Bible handy because we do a quite a bit of looking in the Bible to try to get all the truths put, pulled together. And if you have your Bible handy, would you pray with us now as we begin? Our kind and loving Father, as we look back to those people who lived so long ago in such a different culture and different context, Help us to understand their thinking, why they did what they did, and what that can teach us about you and about your uh, sacrifice that you made on our behalf and what it implies for the, what is going on in heaven today. Um, may we live healthier, better, holier lives as a result of this study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be interested to know that we have materials available that we prepare for our discussions here to sort of add some extra questions to the whole operation. And those materials are available on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You can find it on the internet. So the purpose of this lesson is to understand the ceremonies uh, connected to the great Day of Atonement. And, of course, those ceremonies later were carried out in Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and later on in Herod's temple in Jerusalem. And we need to focus particularly in this lesson on the role of the high priest because this is pretty much a one-man show. And he does pretty much everything because he's doing it on behalf of the entire congregation. So it's not a lot of priests doing a lot of things for a lot of different people. This is the high priest acting on behalf of the entire congregation. So, and who would be our high priest in heaven? Jesus. Jesus. So we're going to take the high priest activities here to teach us something, presumably, about the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, we are living what we call the antitypical Day of Atonement. What do I mean when I say the antitypical Day of Atonement? The word type is in there. Yes. Okay. Anti? Okay, an anti-type is, if, if there's a type, it symbolizes something, it points to something, and the thing it points to is the anti-type. So, as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that the ancient sanctuary year, uh, beginning um, in, in, in April, um, well, about April, May or April, and carrying around to the following April, um, was in symbol a God. There's various ceremonies that take place during that at time, and it was it was. And I'm sorry, it begins in in September and it goes around to September. There's a there's a a, a a civil year which begins in April, and there's a, a religious year that begins in September, and it carries around through the year. And then on the last day, the Day of Atonement, there's the cleansing of the sanctuary, the cleansing of the camp. Presumably at the end of that ceremony, everything is cleansed and, and, and the clamp is completely free of sin. Are you saying that this world from the very beginning to now has its uh, following the sanctuary? Mm -hmm. Like Jesus died as the lamb and the world since the lamb were stepping through these sanctuary processes and so currently, right now, we're living in the Day of Atonement, the very end of the sanctuary well, service. We believe that Daniel 8 and 9 suggest that beginning in the year 1844, on the Day of Atonement in 1844, begins what we call the time of the end. Not the end of time, but the time of the end, the antitypical Day of Atonement. And it's during this time, starting from 1844 until today, until whenever Jesus comes, he's doing the things which are symbolized by what happened on the Day of Atonement in the ancient sanctuary. And 
the Jewish people also did something while the high priest was doing something. So we're supposed to be doing something also mm -hmm. while Jesus is doing something in heaven. And we're going to find out what that exactly. is. And the Day of Atonement, if you want to read about it, it's primarily in Leviticus 16. It was, without a doubt, the most important religious day of the whole year. It sometimes was referred to as the Sabbath of Sabbaths, at Leviticus 16, verse 31. Is that because at the end of the Day of Atonement, Jesus comes back? Well, in the antitypical program, yes. Yeah. Um, this, this was a yearly cycle, right? This is a yearly cycle, yes. So as yes. soon as the year is over with, it starts all over again. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, what, was, what were the people supposed to do on this Day of Atonement? They were not supposed to eat anything for They were not supposed hours. to eat anything from sundown on the ninth day till sundown on the tenth day. They weren't supposed to work. They were not supposed to work. A lot of prayer. They pray a lot. Okay. They were supposed to say, forgive my sins. Well, that was supposed to have been taken care of before we got to this point. They were supposed to avoid almost all of their normal activities. But weren't okay. they supposed to feel bad for their sins? Well, yeah. So, we need to recognize that the regular daily sacrifices that went on all through the year were also carried on in that day. So, it means that there, we haven't, God hadn't forgotten about being forgiving. But there were also special sacrifices for the priest and his family, and then those two special goats, which we will focus on representing Christ and Satan. Thus in type we see that the sins of the people which had been transferred to, to the sanctuary all through the year were on this special day uh, carried out of the sanctuary by the high priest and placed on the head of the scapegoat, and thus in type eliminated from the camp of Israel as the goat was taken away far, far away, so he couldn't come back, okay? And you can read about that in Leviticus 16. Well, let's do that. Leviticus 16, 16. In this way, he will perform the ritual to purify the most holy place from the uncleanness of the people of Israel and from all their sins. He must do this to the tent because it stands in the middle of the camp, which is ritually unclean. And if you come down to verse 20, it'll say when Aaron had is finished performing the ritual to purify the most holy place, the rest of the tent of the Lord's presence on the altar. He shall present to the Lord the live goat chosen for Azazel. So the first question I need to ask you is, who is Azazel? Some people we heard, go ahead, go ahead, John. No, I was just wondering what that word meant in um, the original language. Is it just a name or did it's it? It's just a name. Oh. It's just a name. Now, some people, some scholars have suggested that maybe it stuck to this goat that was carrying away the sins because it was the name of one of the ancient, the, there, there were ancient tribes in that area who worshipped uh, goats, and one of their goat demons may have been called Azazel. That's a possibility. We don't know that for sure. Well, the e e El would be a god, so Azaz of some sort of a god, mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah. And my comment here is that he has a demon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's important to notice that there was no laying on of hands for the goat of the Lord, suggesting its blood was not a carrier of sin. Now last week we talked about the blood carrying the sin into the sanctuary. Now the high priest carries the uh, sins out of the sanctuary, but without any blood being involved. Okay. May I? Mm -hmm. In well, I read that in Hebrew, Azazel means who God strengthens, which sounds really strange. No, I don't Here think so. Here it's in in Hebrew. It was mm. unknown. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it has no. That's what I read too. That it has no particular meaning, that, as far as we know, in the Hebrew. It comes from the Apocalypse of Abraham. Oh, yeah, that may mm -hmm. be from some apocryphal mm -hmm. material. Yeah. Okay, in effect, that goat was not to defile the sanctuary further, but to cleanse it. By the end of this special day, not only the entire camp, but also, say, also the sanctuary itself were to be completely clean and free from sin. That was the, that's the way it was supposed to work. So look at uh, Leviticus 23, 27 to 32. Do not work on that day because it is a day for performing the ritual to take away sin. 
anyone who eats anything on that day will no longer be considered one of God's people. Now, I don't know if that applied to nursing babies or that sort of stuff, but at least that's what it says. And if anyone does any work on that day, the Lord himself will put him to death. This regulation applies to all your descendants, no matter where they live. From sunset on the ninth day of the month to sunset on the tenth, observe this day as a special day of rest during which nothing may be eaten. And I might add, this was a good verse that we might quote to demonstrate the fact that the day went from sundown to sundown. And of course, uh, at, when, these, when these rules were given out there in the desert, <clears throat> work really, in a way, was not absolutely required because their food was provided, everything was provided. Water was provided, food was provided, I mean, work basically would... Now, someone apparently took care of a lot of fox because there were a lot of animals involved here. Where they were, we're, we're, we're not told where those animals were or what, who took care of them. Whether everybody took care of his own little five animals or whatever. We don't know. Anyway, it's important for us to notice that while the daily offerings focused on people's sins and transferring those sins to the tabernacle, the most sacred and holy ceremony of the whole year talked about cleansing the sanctuary. This cleansing was to be a symbol for correcting the misunderstandings and misrepresentations that Satan has made against the government of God so that ultimately every trace of sin is removed and the original cause of sin, who was the original cause of sin? Satan, right? Is recognized and eliminated from the universe. So, um, I would like to say that we, we need to see the bigger picture behind this ceremony. But what happens on the Day of Atonement? As we've already pointed out, almost every detail is carried out by whom? High priest. The high priest himself. Do you remember when God came down on the mountain and gave the Ten Commandments? What was the people's response? Moses you go between us and God. We can't deal with God directly. Yeah, scares us. If he, if he shows up again, we might, he might, we might die. Verses 18, immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments, it says, when the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast and saw the lightning and the smoking mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. They said to Moses, if you speak to us, we will listen. But we are afraid that if God speaks to us, we will die. Now, so what do we have now? We have a high priest standing in the place of people going through these ceremonies, right? The people felt a desperate need for someone to stand between themselves and God. And just as the entire congregation was supposed to be focused on the work of the high priest on that day, this special day, our focus needs to be on the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Is that so, a thing? So why are we to say had the people not, not taken the position that that they don't want to deal uh, directly with God, they want an intermediary, then they wouldn't have had a, this high priest. Is that a... Maybe each person would be allowed to enter the holy place on their own for, to deal with their sins. You think that would... Wouldn't that kind of ruin the illustration? Well, I mean, we don't know what because was. Because Jesus mm -hmm. was kind of the intermediary to, to the universe. Mm -hmm. The intercessor uh, intermediary. Yeah. And uh, Satan wanted to be that way mm -hmm. too. And he couldn't. So uh, if you had all these people going in there, it would kind of... We, just, we don't know what would have happened if they had not asked for a, a mediator. Yeah. It, it's speculation. And I speculate that if they hadn't asked for something in between, we wouldn't have the sanctuary service. Yeah. God might have set up schools, as Ken has brought up several times, or he might have set up some other system other than this blood and sanctuary. Well, I think all God had, would have had to do is turn up the mountain a little bit if they weren't scared of him. All he had to do is turn it up. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> didn't, didn't Jesus come and say to show us that our high priest walks in sandals, is very humble, wants mm -hmm. to talk to us? And didn't Jesus say somewhere in the Bible that I don't have to plead for you. The Father loves you himself. So Jesus came to straighten up that concept that the people needed um, 
someone in between them and God? Yes. He couldn't do that there at, at uh, Mount Sinai because the people, it, it was totally foreign to them. Mm -hmm. uh, their, their idea of God, they needed some majesty and thunder and lightning. He did it as an accommodation to them. Yeah, but Jesus did come to show them the Father. Yes. And it wasn't the Father that came, it was Jesus. Well, if, we're going, if this is going to teach us something about what's going on in heaven right now, Let's, let's look at that picture for a moment and see what is going on. We know, for example, in Revelation 12, verse 10, who is the accuser in heaven? Satan. Satan. So in this antitypical Day of Atonement, and I'm not sure how do you think this fits into, into the Day of Atonement ceremony here on this earth, there is Satan in heaven accusing us. How does that fit? Then we read in Romans 8, 34, who then will condemn them? Not Jesus Christ who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right-hand side of God, pleading with him for us. And if you read all of it, chapter 8, Romans 8, it says, the Holy Spirit's on our side, and Jesus is on our side, the Father's on our side. So clearly, who's against us? It can only be Satan. Well, you know, in heaven, Satan, I think, is not really listened to because Jesus knows that what he's saying is a lie. God knows what he's saying a lie is a lie. But is this the day when Satan is hitting us hard and saying, um, trying to accuse us, accuse us, and, and separate us from mm -hmm. God? So not only in heaven, but maybe this is the day when Satan is raging on earth towards us as humans also. Well, I mean, our cases are being reviewed, aren't they? Yeah. And who's accusing us? Satan. Look, look at a couple more verses. Daniel 7, 9 and 10. This is very familiar. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat on, down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire. And a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people, beings, there to serve him and millions of beings standing stood before him. The court began its session and the books were opened. So that's talking about the judgment day, right? And then, of course, Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, we've already referred to this in a previous lesson. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest, Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord. There stood beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. And God says, Stand back, Satan. Take off Joshua's filthy clothes. Give him clean white clothes. Jesus is pleading for us, and, and Satan is accusing us. So uh, ultimately, we must try, as we understand the Day of Atonement, we should try to figure out how all those pieces fit into the Day of Atonement. On that day when the throne is there with the fiery wheels and the books are open, is that when our life lays open in a book and Satan says, oh, look at that dirty page and look at that dirty page. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and then God, if it goes according to what you just said, says, no, I'm going to put on a clean robe. And um, yeah. Yeah. So look at Leviticus 16, some of the key verses, verses 16 to 20. In this way, he, that's the high priest, will perform the ritual to purify the most holy place from the uncleanness of the people of Israel and from all their sins. He must do this to the tent because it stands in the middle of the camp. And I might point out that it's interesting to notice that Leviticus, the book that describes this process, is in the middle of the Pentateuch. There's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, then there's Numbers and Deuteronomy. And the five books, this one's in the middle. And this chapter is right in the middle of the book. So it stands in the most holy place, I mean in the center focal point of the five books of Moses. There's always something I've heard since I've been a kid, and I don't know if it was just my family that said it. Uh, they said, You're, you stink to high heaven. Your sins are <laughs> something. You stink to high heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could be coming from the sanctuary is stinking because of mm -hmm. our sins, and it has to be cleansed or mm -hmm. cleansed. Yeah. Was that phrase used in any other families here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. oh okay. Okay. From the time Aaron enters the most holy place to perform the ritual of purification until he comes out, there must be no one in the tent. When he has performed the ritual for himself, his family, and the whole community, he must then go out to the altar for burnt offerings and purify it. 
you must take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it all over the projections at the corners of the altar. With his finger, he must sprinkle some of the blood on the altar seven times. And this way, he is to purify it from the sins of the people of Israel and make it holy. When Aaron has finished performing the ritual to purify the most holy place, the rest of the tent and of the Lord's presence and the altar, he shall present to the Lord the live goat chosen for Azazel. And of course, we know he, he placed his, uh, the sins on that goat and off it, was, off it went. But now let's look at some things. This is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 357 by Ellen White. The blood of Christ while it is to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. So in the type, the blood of the sin offering removed the sin from the penitent, but it rested in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. Now why is that important? Does it show that your sin needs to be finally removed from uh, its where it went when it was taken from you? Okay, well, now this is a sort of a trick question in a little bit. Okay. What is different about our belief compared to those of other Christians? In regard to what? Well, in this case, in regard to what happens to a person when he dies. Bang the soul? Sleep death. Oh. We believe that people are sleeping in the grave until the, resurrection. the great day of atonement is finished and there's a resurrection, right? Now these verses say the sins of the, remain in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. What do our friends believe? That when a person dies, they go immediately either to heaven or to hell. When does the judgment take place? They don't really have an answer, I've tried to ask. There's no accommodation. They don't follow this in any way. There's no accommodation for a Day of Atonement in their thinking. So in these ancient sanctuary ceremonies, we see the plan of salvation laid out in very concrete terms. In our day, when we are more accustomed to thinking in terms of ideas, we need to ask ourselves questions like, can sin actually be transferred like that? Can the high priest pick up a whole bunch of sins and put them on the head of the scapegoat and say, go? Can you do that? Two, how are sins eliminated from our lives? How is it, how does it, I mean, does killing a lamb eliminate from the sins from our lives? Three, what can we do in this antitypical Day of Atonement to prepare ourselves for what Christ is now doing in the heavenly sanctuary? Uh, many cliches are used to describe this process. Uh, we've talked about not eating. We've talked about, you know, not working. Now, the Holy Spirit fits into this someplace mm -hmm. in today's world because the Comforter was sent after Jesus went back after his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So is the Holy Spirit's responsibility to get us ready for the final day of atonement? I mean, the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. has to figure in here someplace. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament, but we were actually sent a comforter to do something. Mm -hmm. So is, is the comforter in charge of purifying us? Yes. Yes. Yeah, in many ways. And let me just ask this question. What does it mean to, and this is what the lesson gives us an answer, what does it mean to lean on Christ's merits. This is the answer. This is the solution to the problem. To We're supposed to them. lean on Christ's merits. Yeah. Which of his merits? He has lots of different kinds of merits. <laughs> it's, it's dark speech. It's dark speech. So It sounds good, but it doesn't say anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest here. We have friends, particularly people in the Roman Catholic Church, who believe in saints. And what's a saint? Someone that you pray to? Well, they've, got well, too many, um, they've done too many good works, yeah. for the, for the, they, more than they need for themselves, okay. so, so they have something left over that they can parcel out. Those are called merits. So, in other words, if, if a person actually has, they believe in a kind of balance system. 
if you if you if, if the number of good works that you've done out, outweighs the number of evil works you have done, then you have extra good works that you can share with other people. Jews are not a whole lot different than that. Shoes? Jews. Oh, Jews. The Jewish thing. Okay. So, um, what, is, is that what we're talking about when we talk about leaning on Christ's merits? Well, you know, what I would prefer rather than leaning on Christ is to have Christ to enable me to stand on my own two feet. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that could mean lean on his promises. Mm -hmm. when, when he's done all these things and you like what he's done and you wish that you could do them, uh, wanting to be able to do those things could be leaning on his merits. Okay, that's, there's a possibility. Anybody else want to comment? Well, he says eternal life is to know the Father and the Son, and how do you f know the Father and the Son? You have to incorporate by studying this thing. Yeah. And so th I think it's all those. Okay, let's, let's go in the next step in the process. When Aaron has finished performing the ritual to purify the most holy place, the rest of the tent of the Lord's presence and the altar, he shall present to the Lord the live goat chosen for Azazel. He shall put both his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the evil sins and rebellions. Last week we suggested that no, sin, no sacrifice could be offered for rebellious sins. But here it says, the evil sins and rebellions of the people of Israel and so transfer them to the goat's head. Then the goat is to be driven off into the desert by someone appointed to do it. The goat will carry all their sins away with him into some uninhabited land. And what do you think would happen to that goat? <laughs> die. Okay. Most likely he would, he would be eaten by a wild animal. But assuming that that didn't happen in, in a few days, presumably he would die of starvation out there somewhere. Maybe he found another goat and they got together and had kids and yeah. <laughs> proliferated. <laughs> I mean, who knows? But the, the main point of the whole last thing. Year, you mean. Yeah. The main yeah. point of the whole thing is that he gets led away from yeah. the camp. Yeah. He's no longer there anymore to, to wreak havoc or whatever. And that's the end of the year, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And then it yeah. all starts over again. Well, you know, this day we call the Day of Atonement or an Atonement, but it's, isn't it really the Day of the Covering? A day of cover and, and sin is described as a disease, and you have to quarantine it so you cover it, and then you ultimately push it out of the camp. Uh, isn't that more symbolism? That uh, maybe, and because if sin is a disease, you got to do something about it. Just a forgiveness doesn't solve the problem of, of, of the disease. You need to be healed. Yes. Well, you know, this is um, really like teaching, and like you teach in shop classes. Maybe your students, instead of building houses, use toothpicks or or little pieces of wood and build something. It's not the house, but it's a little model. And so we're having a little model of our sins going away. And this is what is done to teach people what happens. Well, notice that this goat is not killed. Its blood was not shed any way in the camp, anywhere in the camp. So this is, what we're trying to point out is, Adventists, when we turn back to this ceremony, we're not in any way suggesting that Satan dies on our behalf. But in type, it was made responsible for all the sins of the people and then led far away from the camp to die. And what do we believe will happen with Lucifer in the end? Satan? He'll be taken out into the wilderness and... Cast into the lake of fire, yeah. figuratively speaking. Well, who's keeping Satan alive now? God. All right. So ultimately, God just lets him go. Mm -hmm. Stops giving him the so the energy to survive, and he'll be gone. But he can't. Let's let, he wasn't let, able to let that happen when su Satan first did his problem in heaven, because the rest of the universe would misunderstand. That misunderstanding does it come from the wording of this? The good designed by Lot for the Lord is to be used as a sin offering, while the good designed for Ezezo shall be left standing alive before the Lord to make expiation. Expi expiation. expiation. Yes. Expiation. Thank you. With it and to send it off to the wilderness for Ezezo. What does that imply, taken as it's written? Mm -hmm. That could cause some confusion. Well, okay. There's a verse that's supposed to help us understand. 
Look at Deuteronomy 19, 16 to 21. If someone tries to harm someone else by false accusation, both are to go to the one place of worship and be judged by the priests and judges who are then in office. The judges will investigate the case thoroughly, and if someone has made a false accusation against a fellow Israelite, that person is to receive the punishment the accused would have received. And this way you will get rid of this evil. Then everyone else will hear what happened. They will be afraid and no one will ever again do such an evil thing. In such cases, show no mercy. The punishment is to be a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, and a foot for a foot. Okay? Does that make any of you think of anyone who misrepresented somebody else or tried to make accusations against them? It might be worthwhile looking back at the time this was originally. Of course, we're dealing really with what Ezra put together, but let's go back. Let's say it was back uh, shortly after they came out of uh, Egypt. Egypt. And you look what was going on in the other countries based upon the ancient records of the uh, Babylonians and so forth. They, they, they had death penalties back then for, for minor infractions. Mm -hmm. So at least this life, eye for an eye, tooth for the tooth, at least you didn't uh, kill the, the person uh, for minor infractions. Yeah. But it was, it was not the ideal. It was just to lead the people on. But I, I would like to, I would like to and, and I agree with that. That's a very important point. I'd like to take a, take a, let us take a little bit higher view of this. Who has made the accusations against God? Satan. Okay. And how many of those accusations are accurate? Zero. So in the end, according to the rules in the Bible, who is all that falsehood supposed to fall back on? Satan. The one who made the accusations. And what is supposed to happen to that person? Cease to exist. He's supposed to, the results are supposed to be poured back on him that he wanted to happen to God. But it, not only to, was he doing that to God, but he does it to everybody else. Yeah, we sure. have joint and several liability with, with the sins because the adversary encourages everybody to do it. So he's, he's uh, just heaping <laughs> up a big stack Let, against him. Let's think of some examples where that sort of thing actually happened in the Bible. Think of this story in Esther 7, 9 through 10. Right. Remember the whole story about Mordecai outside the gate and, and how Haman got very upset at him because he wouldn't bow down. And so what does Haman do? He builds a gallow that is supposed to chop off uh, Mordecai. Well, supposed to hang Mordecai. Oh, supposed to hang, okay. And what results? What happens on that gallows? Somebody he, else gets hung. Haman, got, Haman, uh, gets Haman, Haman, Haman himself ends up getting hung on the gals he has made for Mordecai. Can you think of any other examples like that from the Bible? You know, it's kind of scary to mess around with God because he does turn things around so that you actually find out what, mm -hmm. get what you get it happening to you, what you had planned for someone else. Mm -hmm. So you I had better not plan anything for anybody else. I don't think it's God turning things around. It just seems like when people accuse somebody of something, mm -hmm. they're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, like they get the idea to accuse that person because they're doing it. Well, and, and Jesus even said that if you judge other people, that you will be judged that same way. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. There could be something there. Yeah, exactly. Well, there are other examples. We won't take time to, to look at them. So where does all that leave us? Where are we in all this picture? How does God deal with us? Well, look at these very important words. This is what comes to be known as the New Covenant. What was the Old Covenant? Was that the Ten Commandments? No. What was the First Covenant? We better look at that one first, huh? Yeah, we better refresh our memories. Exodus, Exodus 19, verse 8. This is just before the giving of the Ten Commandments, before God descends on the mountain, and he, he sends Moses down with instructions to, for the people to get ready. And what's the response? Then all the people answered together, We will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. We will do everything that the Lord said. They hadn't even heard it yet. <laughs> and what, what follows up? 
Well, look what, what, what happens. Moses says, okay, let, let's see what happens. So he says, let me write it all down, and I'll read it to you. So he finally writes it down. He, he says, look at, look at this, this in, in Exodus 24, starting with verse 3. Moses went out and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances. And all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. So they said it twice, once before the Ten Commandments and once after. And they're not done. Moses says, I think I better, I'm, I'm not sure you really understood what I had to say. He wrote it down in a book. And then he said, let me read it to you. Then he took, verse 7, then he took, this is tw Exodus 24, then he took the book of the covenant in which the Lord's commands are written, and he read it aloud to the people. And they said, we will do what, we will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. Three times, Three huh? times. Three times. Just now, made sure that they actually understood what they were well, in ancient mm -hmm. Jewish custom, if you say something once, yeah, maybe. If you say it twice, it's considered to be binding. And if you say it three times, that is it. Absolutely, there's no chance of changing it. That's a contract. Oh, I'll wait over it. Okay. So that was the first covenant. And then what happens next? Well, look at Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, implying that there was a previous covenant, right? It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. So it's clearly talking about the one we just read. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. How long was it before they were dancing drunk and naked around a golden calf? A few days. Forty days. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. You know, that is something that people can embroider and put on their wall. Yeah. That is absolutely beautiful, God's mm -hmm. new covenant. Is it actually, is it, is it explaining how God carries your sins? Well, what about that? Is I that mean, what it's, it's that? like, it's like the first covenant. They said, listen, God, you don't have to carry your sins, our sins, because we'll do what you say. Mm -hmm. And now we've got the second covenant, which which he, he just said this, and it is, he's carrying the sins. Okay, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 358. Ellen White says, Thus, in the ministration of the tabernacle, this is the tent, and of the temple that afterward took its place, the people were taught each day the great truths relative to Christ's death and ministration, and once each year their minds were carried forward to the closing events of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, the final purification of the universe from sin and sinners. So I don't think we've gone beyond the scope of what's intended when we talk about, when we put it in this larger context. Only this time it doesn't recycle, it's done. Done. Sin is finished done. forever. So do you think that the children of Israel understood this great controversy between Christ and Satan and the final purification of the universe? from sin and sinners when they went through the Day of Atonement? Well, and the answer would probably be no. But I hope what they did understand is that this at least symbolized the cleansing of their camp, the whole camp, the whole sanctuary. There goes the sins. We can see them with our own eyes. There goes the goat. The man's pulling it along. He's headed out. There go our sins. And they but, felt somewhat reconciled yeah. to, to God. But did they understand it as a promise that it's awesome. going to be final at some time? Or is it just a process that happens with the circle of life yeah. every year? You know? Yeah. Good question. Well, rest. and do people today realize that Jesus is purifying the entire world and universe Mm -hmm. Are people today saying, focusing on themselves? Well, let me, let, let me, let me, let me move on in the story here. Look at Leviticus 23, 29 and 30. Anyone, who, and this is talking about what's required of the people. 
Anyone who eats anything on that day will no longer be considered one of God's people. Did he take it seriously? And if anyone does any work on that day, the Lord himself will put him to death. This regulation applies to all your descendants no matter where they live. I mean, you know, God says, I want you to take this deadly serious. Did God just want them to not do anything so they could sit and think about what was happening? He wanted them to focus on what? He huh? wanted to focus on what was going on at the sanctuary, what the high priest was doing. That he wanted them to see their sins disappearing. That was a play in words. Which? Um, deadly serious? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> One other important point to notice is that Seventh-day Adventists do not believe in a once saved, always saved theology. We do not believe that forgiveness or justification is the only part of salvation. Now, Martin Luther was big on that. There must come a time on, on the antitypical Day of Atonement, the time of the pre-Advent judgment, where, the time we're living now, when all these issues are brought up and a final decision is made with the whole universe looking on about who should be saved. Remember Daniel 7, 9 to 10? The whole universe is looking on as a decision is made about who should be saved and who should be lost and why. Just as the ancient Israelites were to focus their attention on the activities of the high priest on that day, we need to be focusing on the life and death of Jesus in our day and what he's doing now in the heavenly sanctuary. Well, let's take another example from the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah 6, the first six verses. Now, you remember that Isaiah started out preaching some pretty potent sermons in the first five chapters. And then in, year, in chapter 6, he says, in the year that King Isaiah died, what do we know about Isaiah? This is a guy who started out being a fairly faithful king to God. And he finally got to the place where he thought he was good enough that he could go in and do the work that the Levites did. He didn't need God to do it for him. I mean, he didn't need the Levites to do it for him. And what happened to him, do you remember? He was struck with leprosy. And he, was, I, he had I, it for the rest of his life. I could say co something controversial here. Mm -hmm. Is that where, maybe I won't say it, about women going in and doing what, I mean. What? So he he tried to be the high he tried to be the high priest. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the year that we're talking about here. Isaiah saw I saw the Lord. Now it's 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 not possible to tell for sure whether he is actually in the tabernacle, in the tent, and I'm sorry, in the temple. It would have been in his day whether he was actually in the temple or he only visualized, he only saw himself in the temple in vision. But I saw the Lord. He was sitting on his throne, high and exalted, and his robe filled the whole temple. So clearly, whether it was in vision or whether it was in reality, he saw the temple. And God's glory fills that temple. Round him flaming creatures were standing, each of which had six wings. Each creature covered its face with two wings and its body with two and used the other two for flying. They were calling out to each other, holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. His glory fills the world. The sound of their voices made the foundation of the temple shake, and the temple itself was filled with smoke. I said, there is no hope for me. I am doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful, and I live among a people whose every word is sinful. And yet with my own eyes, I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the creatures flew down to me, carrying a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, This has touched your lips, and now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. So in these first seven verses of Isaiah 6, what's happening? Isaiah is really having his own personal day of atonement, isn't he? If you think about it. Mm. Okay. And just as Isaiah was emboldened to preach the truth to a nation that was not ready to listen following that experience, we should recognize the fact that we are no longer condemned. Okay? And what, what should we do? Romans 8, 1, look at that real quickly. There is no condemnation now for, now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. And what should be the result? 2 Corinthians 5, 8, 
19 to 20. All of this is done by God who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of doing what? Making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. Whose message is that? That's our message. God did not keep an account of their sins just as he cleansed the sanctuary, cleansed the camp, carried the sins out there. God did not keep an account of their sins and he has given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. So how, how does he do that again? How does he make us our, our, his friends? Well, through, we're, supposed, it's, he's, we're supposed to learn that by our understanding of Christ's life, his ministry and his life. So that's, that's what's different, that when he came, um, he was able to illustrate that, that was never illustrated before, except by these types. Well, what this lesson is trying to teach us is, just as that process happened in the ancient sanctuary, mm -hmm. now in our day, our sins have been taken care of, and that would be the end of Romans 7. I didn't read that part. That's where Paul says, you know, woe is me, you know, when I want to do good, I can't do good, and all that sort of stuff. He says, but his conclusion is Romans 8, 1, thanks be to God for there's no condemnation to us in, 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 because of Jesus Christ. So now it's saying to us, now that we have in <coughs> the antitypical Day of Atonement received what in effect is the Day of Atonement's reconciliation and, and, and forgiveness. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Then what are we supposed to do? We have now become God's friends and we're supposed to go out and make his, make friends of, I mean, make God, make friends for God from all the people around us. And you become his friends because you understand him mm -hmm. more. Yes. Well, there was a two-step process you read there. A God forgave, what was it, Isaiah, his sins. And then he put a burning coal on his lips to give him clean lips. Right. So before we can um, do anything, uh, we're to be forgiven of our sins and we're to get the uh, burning coal to cleanse us up a bit before then we can say, God, send me. And that is paralleled Romans 7, Romans 8, and 2 Corinthians that we just read. God forgives us our sins and now there's no condemnation for us and so therefore we should go out and say you know thanks be to God we are, we have experienced the forgiveness and the cleansing and now we want to tell the world about it so that they too can be cleansed so we are to choose life to love God mm -hmm. to walk in God's way and to keep God's commandment because in so doing we open our hearts to God and to each other mm -hmm. It also said we, we, are, we are also instruct, instructed to leave something from our fields mm -hmm. yeah. to the poor and for the stranger. Mm -hmm. What happens if a person says, I want to be forgiven by God, but God says, okay, then here's the piece of coal where, you're gonna, uh, where I'm going to purify your heart and lips and whatever. Mm -hmm. What if we say, no, God, I don't want that. I just want to be forgiven. <laughs> I mean, are you still forgiven? And... and you know. Well, the, the Bible doesn't discuss that, but uh, Paul makes it pretty clear that he thinks that everybody is supposed to go out and tell the world. I mean, this is one of the, one of the things, Ellen White talks about this quite a lot. She says, one of the things that nobody else can argue with is when you tell your own experience. They can argue with you about how to understand this verse and this theological point, whatever, but when you tell your personal experience, this is what God has done for you, no one can argue with you about that. So the people that don't let God do something for them in their lives, they really don't have a story to tell. Yeah. Because I know some people who just want to be forgiven, but they just want to keep on doing whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I had one man tell me, all I have to do is say, God, forgive me, and he's supposed mm -hmm. to forgive you again. Yeah. So then you can go do it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Up to 70 times 7. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ellen White concludes, now the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the Day of Atonement. When the ministration of the Holy of Holies had been completed and the sins of Israel had been removed from the sanctuary by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, then the scapegoat was presented alive before the Lord. 
And in the presence of the congregation, the high priest confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. Leviticus 16.21 In like manner, when the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary has been completed, then in the presence of God and heavenly angels and the hosts of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon Satan, and he will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has caused them to commit. Now, is that the same thing as saying he is going to be exposed? Yes. The, so it's not the truth really, is the truth yeah. is now known. Right. Yeah. I thought I thought the devil didn't make us do all these sins. I thought we did them ourselves. Well, you're reminding me of James one. It says he's going to be the, you know his responsibility is being placed back on him. Everything he's caused uh, that he has caused us to do would be put back on him. But what about James 1, 13 to 15? If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say the temptation comes from God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. And then immediately, if you didn't read on, you would say, and we know who tempts you. And who is it that tempts you? It's the Satan, right? But people are tempted when they are drawn away. I'm reading from the Bible drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. And where's Satan in this? Is that why David prayed, O oh God, give me a clean heart, because David knew his heart was leading him into sin? He didn't mm -hmm. say, O oh God, take Satan away from me. He said, O oh God, give me a clean heart. Well, where did those evil desires come from, anyway? Yeah, well, of course. I mean, it's just we're like following the devil's example. It's just like um, some of us cultivate them. Well, I'm I'm thinking like some kid who learns how to smoke. Some usually some friend gets him to do it, mm -hmm. and then when he starts smoking, well, then it starts becoming a desire. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's kind of. But there, but he's there, still there. There, there is some understanding that. The devil just isn't standing around idly during no. this. But he is involved in, 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 in something here. Well, as Christians, we have looked to the book of Hebrews to help us understand the sanctuary service as described in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Do you think you understand what Christ is doing now in the heavenly sanctuary? Ellen White has suggested that what Jesus is doing now in the heavenly sanctuary is as important as what he did during his ministry on this earth. Could that possibly be true? What do you think Jesus is doing now, which measures up in importance to what he did while he was here on this earth? In light of Daniel 7, 9 and 10, and Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, isn't it clear that God is clarifying, one, who is responsible for all the great controversy mess, two, who is making false accusations against God's people, and three, where this ultimate responsibility lies, right? How does it make you feel to recognize that you are living in the antitypical Day of Atonement? Does it scare you to think that as we speak, the records of all the righteous are being reviewed in heaven? I mean, this is a time when, in the ancient Israelites, they didn't eat. We certainly don't stop eating. They didn't work. We don't stop working. Well, let's summarize. We've only got a few minutes left. Let's try to summarize what took place on the Day of Atonement. What was the first thing that happened? Numbers 29, 11. Let's just read that. Also offer one male goat as a sin offering in addition to the goat offered in the ritual purification for the people and the daily burnt offering with its grain offering and wine offering. So before they launched into this very special day, they had to do the regular things. In other words, God didn't stop being a forgiving God just because some ceremony is going on. Okay? Then... And look at Leviticus 16, 30 to 19. We won't have a chance to read that. I hope you've read through Leviticus 16. You know what's there. It describes events connected with the Lord's goat. Notice several very important points which made this goat a symbol very different from the animals that were sacrificed during the year. One, this goat had sin-free blood. There were no hands laid on its head and no sins confessed over it. Verses 9 and 15. Thus it should be clear that the purpose of the blood of this goat was not to defile the sanctuary, but to cleanse it. Two, the ceremonies of this day revealed an outward movement and not an inward movement. 
sins were being taken away from the sanctuary and not taken into the sanctuary. This was a most solemn day of a judgment for the people of Israel. They were to humble themselves, to avoid work, not to eat, and to avoid virtually all their normal activities. And those who did not were to be cut off. And you know, Leviticus 16, 29, 31, Leviticus 23, 27 to 32. Notice that in Leviticus 16, the whole process was going beyond forgiveness. There was no mention of forgiveness at all in that chapter. All of these activities focused on the final conclusion to the sin problem and not to the individual forgiveness of sins. It focused on cleansing. Christ and the Father in the heavenly sanctuary have opened up the government of God to the eyes of the onlooking universe. Just as the entire congregation was supposed to be watching the high priest, God will make his final judgments with the full cooperation and agreement of the universe. Well, so what should the Day of Atonement have accomplished? The truth is made clear. Okay? The, it's irrefutably proven that Satan has always been the father of lies and is ultimately responsible for sin. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that a Zazel goat or scapegoat was a symbol for Satan and not of Christ. And we won't look at those verses. The Azazel ritual takes place after everything else is completed. So the very last thing that happens in the story of sin is what? Azazel goes to the wilderness. Okay, but in, in the antitypical thing, what's the very last trace of sin that we see? Satan disappears. Satan finally dies. Sin is finished. Zazel's goat was not slain. God doesn't kill Satan. And no blood was dealt with. It was a non-sacrificial event. It had nothing to do with the sacrifice for sin. Instead, the goat was led far away from the camp to die. So the Azazel goat acted like a garbage truck or a tote goat, taking the moral garbage from the camp of Israel far away. Azazel was clearly one of those goat demons. The final result is spelled out in Revelation 20. <clears throat> Satan and all his associates ultimately choose themselves to end up in the lake of fire. They would rather do that than live forever with God in his kind of universe. The accuser of the brethren has had the, accuser, the accusations placed back on his head. And that's the end of the story. See you next week.